The United Nations is seeking to adopt both Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchain technologies for the purposes of delivering food and finances to people in areas of the world that are most in need of these resources and donations. And if the United Nations is successful with creating this system, then the system will continue to work even if the United Nations no longer exist. Let's discuss. Hey everybody, I'm Gary Palmer Jr. You're you. Together, we're minting coins. Thanks for showing up today. There's a lot of information going on in the news. A lot of coins are up, a lot of coins are down. It's a crazy world going out there. And in addition to just the market itself fluctuating, there's so much happening in the world of politics in each of the different countries across the world. It seems as if there's a lot of craziness in America and the United States in the first 100 days of the Trump administration. And now at the same time, we see all sorts of uh, additional elections and decisions in the world that are really affecting each of us because everyone in this world is truly deeply connected. In the past couple of videos, we have been taking a look at the Bitcoin as the different organizations have been looking at Bitcoin and at how they want to manage it. There's the Federal Reserve in the United States. There's the uh, Central Bank in India. There's the Bank of Russia. And there's a lot of organizations that are making decisions and how they're going to apply Bitcoin technology for their jurisdictions and for their citizens. Now, in the last video, in the case of the IMF, we know that the IMF has a goal of world economies and the world economic system of creating policy that's creating uh, stability and sustaining growth in, the, in uh, the finance system and currencies and the interconnected economies of our different countries. And in today's video, we're looking at the United Nations. So just like each of these different organizations, the United Nations has its own mission, its own purpose, and its own reason for existing in terms of why it's here and what it is that the United Nations wants to accomplish. So with that, let's take a deeper dive into the United Nations, who they are, what it is that they're seeking to do with their time and their resources and their energy. And let's take a look into what they're doing with cryptocurrency and how they're taking the blockchain technology and bringing it to the next level of the unbanked and the people of the world who are most in need of technology and financial system and being a part of the world economy. Let's discuss. First, as always, I want to go straight to figure out what is the United Nations and what is the United Nations all about. So here we are at the United Nations homepage at un.org. Uh, here it says United Nations up here and we have the uh, really cool United Nations logo over here and to find more about them we click on about the UN and we get to this page and we click to learn more about the overview and in the overview we read that the United Nations is an international organization founded in 1945 and that it's currently made up of 193 member states and that the mission and work of the United Nations is guided by the purposes and the principles contained in its founding charter. And so if we click on the charter, then we can get all the information about the United Nations as defined by their uh, the details. So real quickly, going over the purposes of the United Nations, the four purposes that they have here are to maintain international peace and security, to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principles of equal rights, to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems, specifically of a economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian level, and to be the center for harmonizing the actions of all nations in the attainment of the common ends of peace and equality. So turning to today's article, 
from Coindust.com, we see that the UN is seeking to adopt Bitcoin and Ethereum and possibly very soon. So the United Nations is in the final stages of what can be described here as an epic blockchain project. And what we know is that there's been a successful test of using the Ethereum blockchain to transmit Pakistani rupees to 100 people earlier this year. This was a part of the UN's World Food Program. And now there's additional pilot tests scheduled in May where there's additional uh, unspecified amounts of dinars that will be sent to 10,000 recipients. And this has a financial goal of increasing this number to 500,000 by next year in 2018. And so they've completed the first test of 100 people. They're working on the next test of 10,000 people. And they're seeking to grow this test to 500,000 people as quickly as 2018. And so if they're successful, what they're seeking to do is to make the UN services so resilient that they could survive the destruction of the UN itself. The UN could be dismantled and these programs that the UN is creating right now, if completed, could be uh, still existing for the people of the world to send money to and for that money to then be received by people who, who, need, who need assistance. So then this article gets very interesting because the WFP financial officer speaks about making this whole process easier. And we can make this whole process e easier by removing the rupee or the fiat currency, whatever the state issued currency is altogether and just have the full system on the blockchain and have uh, money simply sent to the system and have the money distributed through the system so that people, the recipients, the beneficiaries can actually benefit without huge sums of money being lost in remittance fees or fees or middlemen of all different levels. So back to this first initial program that concluded earlier this year, it's called Building Blocks. And this was a successful test on the Ethereum-based blockchain. And this is where they sent 100 people, 3,000 rupees, and the equivalent value in food via transactions that were authenticated on the Ethereum testnet. And then these uh, beneficiaries, the way that this system is designed, it's a, it's a little bit different than what people have been used to. So instead of sending the money through the network and having the individual beneficiaries receive the, the money itself, the beneficiaries of the project were assigned random one-time passwords that were displayed on their mobile devices. And so these passwords were shown to the supermarket owners the proprietors of the supermarket who then helped disperse the food and the funds to the people. And so this is this is really interesting because instead of sending and, and paying these funds directly to the recipients or the beneficiaries, the UN is sending the money to the shops, cutting out both the banks and, and the actual recipients. And so instead of having to you know, figure out the logistics of how to send all of this uh, money to individual people and for people to figure out how to figure out the technology and, and get it to the market, the, the money can be sent directly to the market and then the local communities can uh, distribute this to the people in need. So at the conclusion of that first test in January, now we're working toward this next test in May where they're seeking to really affect uh, tens of thousands of people but this is with the big goal of reaching tens of millions of recipients that can be served by the World Food Program and the United Nations to deliver the, the food and the money that's so desperately needed by so many people around the world. Essentially what the United Nations is trying to figure out, part of the bigger problem here, 
is rethinking what their organization calls cash-based transfers. And instead of turning over perishable resources such as food and medicine, the UN, the UN wants to directly inject the money and the resources into the local economy, doing this in the form of vouchers or prepaid cards or uh, mobile devices. And there's a lot of money going into this program already, and, and they're seeking to increase the efficiency of helping more and more people. So while I'm sure that the United Nations has had a ton of success, the United Nations and the people in charge of this project is really seeking to maximize the efficiency since they see that there's a ton of room for improvement. Uh, issues with the current system are that the current system still suffers from lots of fees. Every system in this world suffers from lots of fees. A lack of privacy for the recipients. Risks associated with relying on startup mobile money companies and different contracting processes to ensure that payments are completed. And 99 to 100% of all of these issues can be reduced by moving these transactions, both incoming and outgoing, to a distributed ledger system, to a blockchain system, to a system such as Bitcoin and or Ethereum. And as we know, there's plenty of different organizations all around the world that are seeking to understand Bitcoin and blockchain technologies. And what we know is that even within a single organization, there's several different groups and internal sub-organizations and sub-committees that are looking into Bitcoin and blockchain technologies. We're researching this information on a parallel course who are looking into the same details, the, the same facts, uh, maybe from slightly different places and overlapping sources, but without necessarily communicating with each other. And in the United Nations, what's going on is that there's increasing internal cooperation between the agencies at the United Nations and the think tanks that are trying to figure out how do they solve their goals using the technology available and uh, what better technology than the latest, greatest technology, blockchain technology. And so I want everyone to, to realize that while the United Nations has these different think tanks developed, you know, for example, in this case, developed as part of the Field Innovation Exchange and the Singularity University, all of these big organizations have think tanks. All of these large companies and nonprofit groups that have think tanks and they have groups of people that are working on this. And most of the time, the, their work is not being publicized on any website. Just a lot of organizations, a lot of people that are working on a lot of different solutions. And these different organizations may have competing objectives. It's a part of our goal to understand what everyone is doing so we know how we fit and how the different systems of this new internet world are gonna to fit together and affect us and affect our communities. Back over at Coindesk.com, the project manager, Alexandria Alden, is hoping that a future incarnations of this technology are built completely on the public Ethereum blockchain. Should it uh, have to grow to handle the necessary transaction volume and uh, need the system and the resources for it to work and function and, and scale to that level. And they have a shared vision and that their goal is to ideally deal with this in a way that even if WFP did not exist in 10 years time, the beneficiaries could still benefit from this system forever, for years to come, for decades to come, for hundreds of years to come. So the, the future of donations you know, really in the benefits of the blockchain and this technology falls down into three different categories, main categories of empowerment. And that's A, empowering the beneficiaries, B, lowering costs, and C, reducing the redundancy. So these are major issues in, in the systems of transferring money and it's something as simple as getting somebody food. The United Nations is telling us is that we need to empower the beneficiaries, lower the cost, and reduce the redundancy to really get maximum efficiency in helping the most number of people. So issues in the past have been 
competitive interest and conflict with different organizations internally and externally not working together. But what we're seeing with the blockchain technology and distributed ledger is that people from all different areas are coming together to make these systems work since these systems don't work unless we all come together. And we see plenty of other initiatives that are bringing people into the world of blockchain and, and really having a huge effect on the world, such as the UN Women, which has partnered with Innovation Norway to make it easier for women and girls to explore blockchain technology. Overall, this is a lot of energy, a lot of thought, a lot of focus being put into helping people in the world through the United Nations and then looking to the Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchain to make this happen. And they have a long way to go. They're not even themselves accepting cryptocurrency at the moment, but they're definitely seeking and figuring out how they can start accepting it. There's, as a large organization, they're suffering the same issues where they need to be able to track where their money's coming from and where their money's going and how it was spent and what it was spent on. But they also recognize that they want to do this in a way that doesn't intrude on the privacy of the actual people who are receiving the benefits uh, from the system. While the United Nations is leading this initiative, the solutions that they come up to the problems and issues that the world is facing with the opportunities that are in front of them are really going to benefit all companies in the blockchain technology space. There are millions of people, if not billions of people, who are starving or hungry or in need of money or food or medical assistance right now all over the world. And for most of those people, there aren't these systems in place to help them. What the United Nations is seeking to do from this article is not only increase the efficiency of delivering the money and the food to these people who are most in need, but using the blockchain, the Ethereum and Bitcoin blockchain technology, the distributed ledger, which will exist essentially f forever, this system can continue to work even if something was to happen with the United Nations. And that's important for all of us to know is that the systems that are created on the blockchain can't be stopped, they can't be turned off, they can't be ended. Once that switch is on and the systems are in place, uh, those rules, those smart contracts can run forever. This technology is gonna continue to allow privacy, security, and financial resources for all the people that need to use it, either at the sending or receiving end. Even if this doesn't affect you directly or indirectly or at all, it's important to realize that this is the potential of tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people who are currently unbanked, who can become banked, not with Wells Fargo or Chase Bank, but with Bitcoin and with Ethereum and on the blockchain. This will increase the demand of Bitcoin, of Ethereum and different cryptocurrencies that are utilizing the protocol to allow this system to function. And that's gonna increase the demand for everyone that's holding it and for everyone that's using it. Because as more applications are going online, as more software, as more services are being created, for everyone, the millions of people that are, who are using these applications to use these applications will need to spend the fuel to have these applications function. Not just this application with the United Nations, but as all of these applications continue to get developed and slowly become integrated, not just with each other, but with the whole world, it's gonna create an ecosystem for these markets that is gonna get out of control really, really fast. Before that happens, you want to know about Bitcoin, you want to know about Ethereum, you want to understand this blockchain technology well enough to know if you want to get your hands on it. If you want to go to Coinbase.com and purchase Bitcoin and purchase blockchain and share this video with your friends, with your family to educate them about Bitcoin and blockchain technology. They want to know about this so they can make a decision about Bitcoin and blockchain technology before they hear about it on the news and before they hear about it from their local banks because by the time that happens, 
Bitcoin could be a lot more expensive than where it is now. So with that, we will talk again soon. I want to thank you for showing up and for sticking around and for learning about this information with me. If uh, this helped you or inspired you or if you learned anything new, please give me a thumbs up. I uh, really appreciate that. It really helps the channel and I really appreciate your support. Uh, feel free to comment below if you have any questions because I want to know what do you think? What do you want to know more about? And what do you think about this video or what do you think about the United Nations? With that being said, thanks for showing up. See you soon. And I'm glad together we're minting coins.